for the third talk in LumCon's online science series. Every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central, we're inviting a Louisiana scientists to share their research, and we're gonna give you the opportunity to listen and to ask questions of some truly amazing scientists doing some really extraordinary research. And I hope you will continue to join us each and every week as we explore more of our world from the comfort of our homes. Now you can find more information about the complete series at our website, lumcon.edu. Just scroll down uh, our homepage to the link under news and events. Tonight is my true privilege to introduce Dr. Beth Stouffer, uh, an assistant professor at the Department of Biology at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Now, prior to joining the UL Lafayette faculty in 2015, she was a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow hosted by the US Environmental Protection Agency and a fellow at the Lamont Doherty uh, Earth Observatory at Columbia University. Dr. Uh, Stouffer's research focuses on understanding how dynamic physical environments and variable grazing interactions contribute to changing phytoplankton communities in coastal waters and what those effects mean for estuarine and marine food webs. She is an early career research fellow with the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Science, Engineering and Medicine Golf Research Program and was a LaDia fellow with the Louisiana Sea Grant. Uh, Dr. Stouffer is also a member of the LumCon Advisory Council and the founder and organizer of the Science on the Bayou Informal Science Communication Series in Lafayette. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Stouffer. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Craig. Thanks uh, to LumCon for the um, invitation to come uh, speak to you guys from the comfort of my home. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm gonna close that. Um, Mert, somebody let me know if you can't still see me, but I think I'm good to go. Um, so I am gonna talk to you tonight a little bit about uh, some really large scale events that, that impact um, our coastlines, but rather than looking at you know, some of those really massive scale effects that they have, talk to you a little bit about some of the impacts that we're researching in my lab at ULF yet on those smaller scale, really microscopic level impacts. Um, oops, how do I, oh, hang on, I'm not sure. Oh, sorry, okay. I think I have advanced the slide. Someone tell me if it is not working. Um, this is a picture from one of my favorite uh, study sites down here in Louisiana, a, a photo from Sunset at Sycamore Point. And I, I'm starting with this just because um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is our, our events that impact people and communities that, that live near the coast. Um, a statistic that I often um, share with students in my estuarine ecology classes, for example, is that, um, you know, odds are a lot of you who are tuning in tonight live near the coast. Uh, about almost 40% of Americans um, live in coastal counties. That number was actually expected to grow a fair bit in the last 10 years, even though those coastal counties only make up about 10% of the land. And you know, that um, proximity to, to the coast, to the estuaries and to the ocean um, means that where um, a lot of us are living is also an area where there are um, several different types of hazards that, that we have to deal with. Um, you know, on one hand, there's a lot of really wonderful things about living near the coast, whether it's the sunsets or um, being able to take advantage of you know, fresh seafood or some of those recreational uses, certainly jobs. But there are also some um, hazards associated with living in coastal areas, things um, such as sea level rise, erosion, um, and then storm events and flooding. And these are the ones that I'm, I'm really going to be focusing on this evening. Um, you know, here on the Gulf Coast where LumCon and the folks at LumCon and myself, um, and I'm sure a lot of you as well are living, um, those, those hazards are kind of a, a way of life. Um, this is a map of, you know, those spaghetti diagrams of hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin. And you can see that uh, a lot of those, let me see if I can pull up my spotlight, um, you know, that a lot of those are you know coming through the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I will use this as an opportunity to plug, um, hang on, I think I'm going to not use the drawing tools. Okay, um, 
an opportunity to plug the fact that we are about a month away from hurricane season. It seems like a somewhat terrible thing to think about in the midst of, of everything else going on right now. But um, I think every time I talk about some of our hurricane research, uh, it's important to remember that we have um, we have some other things to start thinking about pretty soon and making sure that we have have plans for something that's a little bit more predictable than our current um, current situation. So PSA is over. Uh, let's head back to some of our coastal hazards. So obviously hurricanes are a current feature of life on the, the Gulf Coast and in a lot of other coastal areas. Um, so are things like floods. And those floods can kind of come from either side, whether it's storms pushing water in from the coastal ocean or or really, you know, rivers and lakes and inland bodies of water that are um, flooding and, and creating um, those impacts on these coastal communities. And of course, you know, hurricanes and floods are events that can shape communities that can, you know, really leave indelible marks on, on the humans in those um, systems. But they're also pretty important for structuring um, the, the natural environment as well. Um, you don't have to look too hard to see some of those ecosystem or ecological effects of hurricanes and floods. Um, these are just some photos of, you know, in, in the aftermath of Hurricane Michael and the Florida Panhandle, where you see a huge, what we consider a disturbance event in, in clearing all of these trees and, and snapping these trees, and then what that does to the, the underlying um, plants and to the, the animals that use these ecosystems for habitat. Um, you can see the damage, these before and after photos from a coral reef in the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands before and after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Right? There is very significant destruction that can occur and, and really huge ecological impacts of um, especially these large storms. When we think about flooding, we can also see some really significant effects in an ecological and ecosystem sense, whether it's um, ghost forests, such as this photo on the left, um, which is where you have um, the death of, of trees, of, of wetland plants and trees, um, because of saltier water pushing into these otherwise low salinity wetlands, or down here in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, the effects of, of too much fresh water getting into our coastal estuaries and resulting in some um, pretty significant impacts on uh, some of the economically and ecologically important organisms there. Um, but ultimately, my interest is in the plankton. So whenever we see these sorts of events, right, there's there's this question that just um, has not really been studied um, as as deeply, which is, you know, what's happening to the plankton communities in these coastal waters? Um, that are being impacted by these large storm events and or these large flood events that are impacting those estuaries and coasts. Um, so what are plankton, you might ask? Um, I kind of thanks SpongeBob SquarePants every day for giving us a great little cartoon that a lot of people and certainly I'm sure some of our younger attendees um, are familiar with. Um, so that's actually not the plankton I'm going to be talking about. I think that would be a very different talk tonight, um, but be happy to chat more about SpongeBob SquarePants some other time. Rather, uh, the, my study organisms come from this Greek word for errant or wanderer. Um, as the dictionary defines them, right, the, these are passively floating or weakly swimming, usually minute animal and plant-like life, I would say, um, in a body of water. And so these are typically microscopic um, organisms that can be the base of food webs, um, but that ultimately are kind of moving with the water that they're in. They can't, you know, decide to swim north or south. Um, they can sometimes swim vertically, but, but that's kind of the extent of their ability to move in that environment. And so, um, so we're talking about organisms that are microscopic. So I always like to spend uh, just a minute giving you a sense of that scale. Um, uh, how many of you guys have picked up an old an old hobby during our, our quarantine. I recently started cross-stitching again, which was very challenging at first. Um, but if you look at your kind of standard needle, the eye of that needle is about one millimeter in, in width or in diameter, um, which is about a thousand microns or mic micrometers. Um, 
Another example that I like to use is human hair. Kind of the average um, strand of human hair is about 100 microns. You can kind of see it, you know, more up close um, in this in this electron micrograph. And so when we're talking about microscopic organisms, we're talking about those organisms that are smaller than um, that eye of the needle, that are more on the scale of that human hair. So when we when we talk about the plankton, there's actually, you know, it's it's I like to say it's a lifestyle. It's not a taxonomic group. It's not a um, you know a, a species or a genus. Um, instead, it's it's a large group of different organisms with a huge amount of diversity um, across these different microscopic scales. So at the smallest scale, we have members of um, basically the prokaryotes. So if you think back to you know freshman biology, um, bacteria and archaea. These are very small. Um, some are um, are photosynthetic. Mo a lot of them are um, consumers. Uh, we then have um, members of the plankton who are much bigger, who range from kind of the, the the width of that human hair to meters in size. And these are multi-celled eukaryotes or animals, right, like us, um, that that can, again, range a, a pretty uh, wide size range. And these are, you know, those consumers of, of maybe some of the smaller um, plankton. And then finally, we have these single-celled eukaryotes. So these are little factories for photosynthesis or for um, consuming other organisms that, that have everything they need in a single cell. These are kind of that intermediate size, so about two to maybe 200 microns. So still very much microscopic. You know, you have a hard time seeing anything with your naked eye. Um, but, but again, you know, several what we would consider orders of magnitude in those size ranges. And these are the, the organisms that, that just capture my attention. Um, uh, some of the research that I'll tell you about today, um, you know, comes down to, you know, different size groups, but really the diversity in, in the phytoplankton, so those are those plant-like members of the plankton, and the microzooplankton, which are these really small consumers. You can see some pictures of those on the right here. Um, there's just so much diversity. These communities are so rich. Um, it's just been a, a really fun area of research to, um, to spend my career in so far. And so other than my, you know, appreciation of their beauty and diversity, why, why do we care about the plankton? Well, first of all, um, they, most of well, the phytoplankton are photosynthetic. And so if we consider that rainforests produce 20, you know, plus, plus maybe 10 or 20% of the global oxygen in, in, on the planet, um, guess who produces the rest? Plankton, phytoplankton. And they do that through, um, massive blooms, such as this one that, that you can see from space. Um, they do that through some of these really small cells, some of those one or two micron cells that we find out in the middle of the ocean. And so um, they're very important in terms of, you know, global climate, the movement of, or the production of oxygen. Um, they're also really important in terms of cycles related to carbon as well. And so carbon is, you know, that fundamental unit of life um, and really the base of, of food webs. And so when we're thinking about phytoplankton, you can see in this, um, this figure from of the biological carbon pump that carbon dioxide enters the ocean and it is fixed by phytoplankton. They are that first step in this, um, this what we call the biological carbon pump that fixes carbon from the atmosphere. Um, that carbon gets moved through the food webs in the ocean. It also gets exported to the deep sea. If any of you tuned in last week to um, Dr. McLean's talk, um, he talked about you know, how much or actually how little of this material actually makes it to the deep sea. But ultimately, that sinking and that export is a really important part of, of how, we, how we, how the world, how the, the um, planet and how the oceans sequester carbon, kind of keeping it locked away for, um, for millennia. Um, and then, of course, they also produce oxygen, which I already um, discussed. Um, so about, you know, 200 or so of the breaths that I take during this talk, um, we're going to be able to thank plankton for. So they're really important in terms of some of these fundamental cycles of carbon and oxygen that 
um, really define life on, on our planet. Um, they're also the base of the food web, right? So ocean food webs um, pretty much start with the phytoplankton. This is a, a very simplified kind of food pyramid um, where the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton and then kind of everything eats all of that. And you know, this, this kind of makes a lot of sense, but um, I'll just throw this really crazy figure up for a second. In reality, the base of this food web is actually a lot more complex than that. Um, and so this is from a, a paper that really laid out some of the different organisms within those groups in the plankton. And so there's a lot um, within that, that oceanic food web that's actually happening just within these kind of smallest to slightly bigger um, members of, of the plankton. Because there are all of these different um, organisms that are consuming, getting consumed, or being consumed, or consuming each other, doing the consumption, there actually there ends up being a lot of different ways that carbon or energy, right, can move through these food webs. And some of these pathways, such as this one from a, a pretty big member of the plankton, um, a, a phytoplankton cell, is that actually a chain-forming um, dinoflagellate, uh, getting directly consumed by a copepod, that's a really high efficiency pathway that moves a lot of that energy up to those, you know, fish and then larger fish. On the flip side, there are some other pathways, such as um, this one that moves from these really smallest cells through kind of intermediate consumers and eventually get up to those higher trophic levels that are a lot less efficient. And so ultimately, these are the sorts of questions that we want to understand relative to some of these large scale events um, that are affecting the coastal ocean and of course um, the, the ecosystems um, in, in those waters and that those, that those waters represent. Sorry. So I'm going to start off with a, um, a project that is kind of newer to our group um, and that has been looking at how the 2019 Mississippi River flood um, was it has impacted the phytoplankton in and those food webs in this system of estuaries in the western part of Louisiana. Um, this work has been funded by Louisiana Sea Grant, and it was really motivated by the fact that 2019 was a record high water level for basically 226 days, I think it was. Um, starting from kind of the previous year. The Mississippi River drains a, a large percentage of the, the continental United States. And so it was a really wet year from basically 2018 into 2019. And ultimately, all of that water moved down the Mississippi River. You can see in these, um, these satellite images kind of a normal year in 2018 compared to 2019 on the right, where you can see all of that that blue in this image, right, which is that water in the Mississippi River. It was swollen. Um, there were a lot of um, issues related to this flooding. Um, so why does that matter to phytoplankton in, in our estuaries? Well, when those river levels are high, when you have high volumes of that river water coming into these estuaries, um, you're introducing a lot of fresh water, so you're driving down the salinity, you're changing the environment that those organisms are in. You're adding nutrients, which much like your plants at home, when you add fertilizer, right, can stimulate growth of a phytoplankton. And you're also adding really high sediment loads, which can actually um, cut out light, can actually um, kind of counteract some of that stimulatory effect of the, of the nutrient additions. So all of these things have an effect on, on the plankton communities and certainly the phytoplankton. So we know that this, uh, this high river year um, had some really negative impacts on um, the Gulf of Mexico um, specifically. So when they open one of those spillways to kind of uh, alleviate some of the pressure on the river, um, that leads these days to a toxic algal bloom in Lake Pontchartrain that then makes its way to Mississippi and uh, Mississippi's beaches had a lot of economic impacts from that event. Um, there were also some significant impacts on those fisheries, so um, oysters and other fish um, that are caught for commercial and re recreational um, purposes here uh, were also negatively impacted to the point where um, they they declared a disaster um, so that some of those fishermen and, and um, people could get help. So 
what does that have to do with phytoplankton? So what we wanted to do was go out um, and compare kind of the summer to fall of 2019 in this network of, um, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing my slides. Um, see, so in this uh, network of estuaries on the west side, western side of Louisiana, um, we wanted to see, right, does this, you know, input of fresh water actually have an effect? Do things change in, um, in these estuaries as a result of, the, of this fresh water coming in? These estuaries are often kind of on the fresher side because they're influenced by the main distributary of the Mississippi River, the Atchafalaya River. Um, but one of the things that we very quickly saw when we start going out and measuring just kind of the environment was that, yes, 2019, which is shown here in red, um, was really different than the, um, than the prior, previous years that we had measured at the same locations, um, kind of in the same months. And so this plot is a, a way of trying to visualize kind of how the overall environment changed. And so we can see that that overall environment changed. It was driven by changes in nutrients. So those, um, those compounds, those elements that are going to you know, support or limit phytoplankton growth. It was also driven by um, differences in, in salinity and, and some other things. And so we can at least say, okay, yes, we know that these floods had a really significant impact on the, the environment itself. And if you remember, right, those plankton, they can't say, oh, I don't like this environment, I'm gonna go somewhere else. They're kind of stuck there. They're, they're moving with the water, um, but ultimately they can't really change their location. Um, and this work has really been done um, by one of my PhD students, Andrea Jaggi, and also supported by our research associate, who uh, Jen Robbie, and this is a picture of them out on a on a somewhat uh, stormy afternoon in Vermilion Bay. If we zoom in and look a little bit um, closer, so this is these are some data from two of our onshore sites. So these are sites that we can access. From land, um, this is data that uh, an undergrad student um, she'll be graduating in about two, two weeks. Yeah, three weeks. Um, Terry Lewis has been doing in my lab, and so here we can again kind of compare these sites to historic data that we have, and we see that from May through basically July, the salinity at Sycamore Point, this green um, triangle, was really low compared to previous years. Um, we can also see that at both of these locations, the salinity didn't start to increase, right? That increase in salinity means a little bit less of the influence of that freshwater until about August. Um, what's interesting then is, you know, bringing this back to the phytoplankton themselves, we can start to see finally a little bit of an increase in that, um, in those, uh, the phytoplankton biomass. So this is um, chlorophyll, just like, you know, land plants have, have chlorophyll, which um, allows them to you know, harness that light. So do phytoplankton. So we can use that to measure kind of how much phytoplankton is in a location. And so this is some work that we're continuing. But what we're seeing right now is that, yes, these floods do have an effect. They fundamentally change the environment. And we see changes over kind of the time course of those flood events in the phytoplankton biomass. Um, the next steps in this are to actually dig in a little bit more and see if the communities in those um, phyto, if the phytoplankton communities are changing as well. So we're going to um, just shift gears really quickly and, and spend the last um, probably 10 minutes talking about and, and learning about um, another extreme event that um, was on a really massive scale and that influenced the Texas and Louisiana coast back in 2017, and that's Hurricane Harvey. Um, hurricane Harvey was, of course, a massive event, a massive hurricane, um, category four. It um, delivered 33 trillion gallons of water to the coast and, and into Houston. Um, when this event, when this hurricane hit, right, the, the images coming out of Houston were, were devastating. What also happened as all of these floodwaters drained is that they drained through Galveston Bay. And so you can see in this satellite image um, in the lower left, that kind of muddy, um, fresher water, right, leaking out of, pouring out of Galveston Bay in the aftermath, in the, in the weeks and the months literally after Hurricane Harvey. And so 
um, you know, we were all hunkered down and and thinking about, you know, wow, this is awful. But then you also start to wonder, right? What are some of the the ecological effects um, on on the coastal ocean? So this is a project that um, was done collaboratively with some colleagues at UL Lafayette, Kelly Robinson's lab, um, NC State. Uh, Astrid Schnetzer's lab and Simon Geis' lab at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. It was also um, really facilitated by some ongoing NOAA projects uh, that Leticia Barbaro and Glenn Zapfi run. Um, and this is a, a picture of us at the end of our, our last cruise, all pretty tuckered out. So um, the, the goal of this um, this study was to really compare the conditions um, off the Louisiana, Texas coast prior to Hurricane Harvey to the conditions after. And it's really rare, honestly, that you have data from before an event like this happens because, you know, we don't perfectly predict when, when and where a hurricane is going to hit each year. Um, but we had, you know, luckily, uh, fortunately, been invited to be part of a, a NOAA cruise, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that goes out once every four years to look at um, the carbon chemistry, the kind of ecosystem effects of that, of that carbon chemistry throughout the Gulf of Mexico. And so these are students, uh, one student from my lab and another from my colleagues at lab at NC State who had never been to sea before. And we said, do you guys want to go on a research cruise? And they said, sure. And then we said, it's 35 days. So they spent, they were total troopers and went out and did this entire Gulf wide cruise, um, collecting samples to characterize the phytoplankton communities and also to quantify some of those food web interactions. So this is where some of um, the interesting food web work comes in. We were then able um, through uh, funding from the National Science Foundation to do three cruises um, on, in, in the months following um, Hurricane Harvey in October, January, and March um, following the storm. We also were able to get samples from a September cruise that went out from uh, a NOAA program called CMAP. And so we were able to use two of the, the fabulous research vessels that are docked at, at LUMCON, the Point Sur and the Pelican. And we were able to really zoom in on that kind of um, area off the coast of Galveston Bay where we expected to see the most impacts from Hurricane Harvey. And so I just wanted to spend a, a quick minute sharing a little bit about life on a research vessel. Um, this is a, a somewhat unique aspect of, of my kind of career path that I've always really enjoyed. Um, the date on this photo is wrong, so I don't know why it says it's 1994, but I would have been a little too young to go to sea in 1994. Just barely. Um, but this is actually a photo from uh, me leaving that my parents took uh, on my first research cruise in basically January 2001. Uh, I was a marine technician. My first job out of undergrad was going out and supporting scientists on these research vessels. And um, and in a lot of ways, you know, this experience and kind of the year I spent being a seagoing marine technician really shaped my career going forward. Um, as I went through grad school and postdoc and, and uh, so on, I was able to also use large research vessels to do science in, in really fun places like the Bering Sea, where we're seeing huge changes in, um, in climate, in sea ice, and, and then we're trying to understand what that means for the food webs, the very economically important food webs um, in that area. And also in um, the Ross Sea, Antarctica, this is a photo from our, our crossing from New Zealand to the Ross Sea and, and probably the worst seas I've ever been in. But, you know, it's good to experience that at least once in your life, I guess. But so for our, our Hurricane Harvey cruises, we were able to go out on those three cruises um, on the ships. And really, these are floating labs. These are ways of going out and kind of doing everything you need to to start to ask these questions and, and really collect the data and the samples and run the experiments that you need to answer them. And so we deployed sensors, um, sensor packages from the ship that measure salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and other parameters. Um, they, we also were able to collect water from these systems that then we could um, sample and analyze to really characterize that community of phytoplankton and also be able to run some experiments to actually document and quantify how much of that phytoplankton was moving up into those higher trophic levels. Um, 
you can set up microscopes at sea. Um, you try not to use them when it's really rough, but you know you get it done. And um, the both of those ships are really great for for doing work at sea. And then you know life on a research vessel is also about trying to have a little bit of fun in your very limited downtime, whether it's um, shrinking some styrofoam cups for uh, school kids around the country, uh, or it's you know saying hi to the visitors or taking a moment to appreciate a beautiful sunrise and sunset most days. So what, what have we found um, when, when we're asking, you know, what about the plankton in, in terms of these extreme events that are hitting our coastal waters? Um, this is some work that a PhD student, uh, Golja Kurte in my lab has been working up. And uh, what she's finding and what she's showing in this graph here is that, again, Hurricane Harvey fundamentally changed that coastal environment. This is salinity data. And basically these bars and kind of the, the position of these bars in, in this graph show kind of where the average salinity was for the month of September um, in, in a, a location that's pretty close to one of our stations um, on, our, our, uh, on our cruise map. And you know what this is showing you is that 2017 was just fundamentally different. It was about a 20 to 30% decrease in salinity. Um, and salinity is one of those factors that helps determine which species uh, are going to thrive in a certain location, right? Different species have different tolerances and, and it can have a really important effect. When we then compare samples that we collected in September and October, um, especially in those really near shore stations, for that phytoplankton biomass, how much phytoplankton was there? Was it the same as normal? Was it higher? Was it lower? Um, and, and we compare it to a historic data set that um, uh, is from 2006 to 16, including 2018. We see that actually, right, our values, so these um, small circles and squares, or sorry, triangles, were actually also a fair bit lower than what you would expect from those more inshore stations, again, during this time of year, this kind of early fall um, period. And so we know that the environment changed. We know that there was, at least in kind of September and, and October, kind of overall less phytoplankton biomass in these near shore locations. Um, you know, is that all we can say? So no, we took a lot of different samples to try and characterize those communities a lot of different ways. Um, so this, this graph is showing you basically that July cruise data, so prior to Hurricane Harvey, followed by October, about six weeks after Hurricane Harvey, January of um, the following year, so a couple months after that, and then March. And so then, and the really main takeaway that I want you to see is that from July to October, we saw an order of magnitude, so you know, a tenfold decrease in some of the, the phytoplankton groups um, that we define by size in those near shore stations. And so you can see in July, there's this big black bar. That black bar is almost gone in October. That shows actually that there's, there's a decrease in biomass, but it's almost entirely in some of those smallest groups. Um, and on the flip side, we see a little bit of an increase in those groups as we move further offshore. So the, the top row is the furthest inshore stations, and then we move a little bit further offshore in those subsequent rows. So what does that mean? If you think back to our food web, right, we're, we're losing a lot of those um, smallest uh, phytoplankton in this, in this community as we move from July to October. Um, could it mean, right, that those are actually getting consumed really rapidly through this, this pathway in that food web? And so we were actually able to measure that. And so we, we collected a lot of samples, but we also conducted experiments. So we mixed water in, in bottles and we used a method that allows us to quantify how much grazing, how much consumption is being done um, on, on those phytoplankton communities and primarily by those kind of intermediate consumers that are represented um, by these kind of ciliates and, and dinoflagellates um, in, in this food web diagram. And what we see is that overall, um, the grazing rates on those smallest cells, again, are 
really high. They're almost double what they were in July um, from stations a little bit further to the east, but still kind of in those near shore areas. Um, they're more than double, uh, especially in those offshore stations compared to later months. And generally what all of these data are showing is that we have really high consumption by these intermediate consumers on those really small cells, on those really small um, community members in, of the phytoplankton. What does that mean? That means that most of that material during this transition period after Hurricane Harvey was likely flowing through this less efficient food web pathway. This pathway was really ramped up in those months after Hurricane Harvey. Why does that matter? Well, every time you add an intermediate, every, every time you add you know, one trophic level, you lose maybe about 10% of your um, uh, upper, sorry, of your transfer efficiency. Um, you end up losing more than that, but it's kind of a, you know, you, you start to squeeze a little bit less of the, or more of the energy out each through that, that pathway, through those um, transfer steps. And so that means that there's actually probably less material, less carbon, less energy, making it to these copepods, making it to some of those small fish and those larger fish. Um, we're lucky because with that collaborative group, we have colleagues who are measuring um, those larger zooplankton, who are measuring those um, juvenile and larval fish. And so the next steps for this project are to really you know, tie this back to, you know, what are the overall ecosystem effects and what does it mean for, you know, that next year of fisheries, that next year of, of overall production in these waters. So to kind of wrap up, um, you know, we can start to answer, you know, what about the plankton when it comes to these sorts of events. Uh, we are showing that, you know, these events are fundamentally changing those coastal marine environments. You know, a lot of times we think of the ocean as being vast and massive and well, you know, is a, you know, is a little bit of river water going to really change that environment? Yes, it is, especially in some of these um, estuarine and nearshore waters. Um, we're seeing changes in how much phytoplankton is present after these events. In both Hurricane Harvey and the floods, we see kind of low overall biomass in the immediate aftermath or while those um, events are happening. But then they increase a little bit later or a little further out in, into the ocean. We're also seeing pretty substantial changes in who is in those communities, right? So we're seeing um, a loss of some of those smaller uh, size groups. And, and ultimately, we're also seeing then those changes in the food web structure and function and connections. And so we really have to start to understand what that means to some of these larger ecosystem impacts. Um, and things that, that, you know, even if you don't wake up really wondering what about the plankton every day, you probably do want to know what's happening with your fisheries or with oysters or with some of those important organisms that, that ultimately rely on phytoplankton as the base of, of their diets as well. So I'll stop there and um, just want to thank everyone who's contributed to these projects. Um, always appreciate the folks who make research cruises safe, productive, and also fun. So thanks, and I'll, I'll happily take some questions. Great talk, Beth. Thank you so much for that. We are having questions uh, rolling in at this point, um, but the first one is, um, is a very interesting question, so I'm just gonna read it as it's written. The drop in phytoplankton then means a reduction in the carbon sequestration, and that in turn should cause the global temperatures to rise. Has this been seen? Say that again. So that would be a drop in carbon sequestration. Right, okay. So um, that is really hard to measure. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, that diagram of the biological carbon pump, there are parts of it that we have a pretty good handle on, like how much carbon is being fixed by, carbon dioxide is being fixed by phytoplankton. We're getting a better handle on how much of that carbon gets exported or you know moves through the food webs. Um, but then what gets kind of recycled in the upper ocean and kind of uh, re-emitted to the atmosphere um, is, is not quite as well constrained. But yes, that is the kind of feedback loop that we would expect. If, if you see less of that carbon export, 
um, and more of that material just gets kind of munched on and then recycled and uh, returned to the atmosphere, then yes, that would serve as kind of a positive feedback loop into increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's really interesting. Um, great. And then Aaron has a question about whether you measured the diversity of phytoplankton. Yeah, and so we, um, I didn't show that in, in this um, because some of what I, what I showed was more based on size, and so we don't usually use diversity indices for size, but um, we, we are, we do have a lot of samples that have been run, that are still getting run, um, that actually look at the taxa, right, that change, and that's where diversity indices come in. Um, and so we don't have that quite yet, but stay tuned. That's work coming out of uh, my colleague Astrid Schnetzer's lab uh, from NC State. And um, I know my colleagues, uh, Kelly Robinson and Simon Geist, are also looking at diversity of some of the larger zooplankton and larval fish, the ichthyoplankton, if you will, um, uh, as part of this project as well. Perfect. And then Michael has a question. For Hurricane Harvey research, did you look at the relative importance of light or nutrient limitation of phytoplankton? Right, so um, we do have nutrient data, and actually, you know, I kind of simplified things today, but the story behind that change from July into September and then into October is really interesting. Um, and so we think that there actually was a stimulus of, um, of nutrients into the coastal ocean with Hurricane Harvey. Um, but by the time we got out there in October, um, a lot of that biomass had gone away. We can see it in some ways in the September data, but we don't have all of the samples um, from September that we, we would have wanted, and we don't have the nutrient data, unfortunately. But other studies have shown that there were pretty high nutrient concentrations coming out of Galveston Bay. Um, in terms of light, yes, we, we have data. Um, so when you lower that CTD package, it has a little light sensor on it. And so you can actually look at the vertical profiles of light and how those change, um, you know, as we move from onshore to offshore along that kind of those stations. And also, of course, you know, from month to month. Um, and so that is part of the analyses that we're doing to really try and understand the drivers, right, of that change in biomass and also the changes in uh, community structure and food webs that we're seeing. Great. Arturo has a question. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I was listening. <laughs> I was paying more attention to you than the questions. Sorry, guys. Um, plankton biomass increases towards the end of 2019 flood of, of the 2019 flood event. With with nutrient rich river water present during flooding. Why is biomass lower during that time? Is it a limiting nutrient like phosphate or high turbidity? Yeah, so um, what we think, and this has actually been pretty well established um, in systems like the Amazon River Plume, where you have really high nutrients and really high turbidity waters coming out, and also in the Mississippi River Plume, uh, coming out, right? So there's those nutrients, but the light is probably limiting in those cases. And, and so it takes a little bit of distance and or a little bit of time for, um, for there to be kind of enough light and still enough nutrients in order to see that increase in biomass. So um, the figure that I showed actually showed the most increase at the station that's a little bit further away from the Atchafalaya River. And so, you know, a little bit further away where, um, where some of that, that turbidity, some of those um, suspended sediments um, are possibly falling out of the water column and water quality is a little bit higher. We also are looking at the nutrient data that we have from that study, and we are seeing pretty high nutrient levels, especially in that kind of May to May to July or August period. Um, the other interesting thing about that study is that that further away site is also somewhat protected by Marsh Island um, down in Vermilion Bay. And so it's also kind of a low mixing, high residence time um, area. So. You're kind of dosing it with some nutrients, and then you're also kind of letting it sit, kind of like more of a bathtub, and and giving um, giving those organisms maybe a little bit more time to grow and also be retained in that system. So there's a lot of factors that are are going into some of those results that we're seeing. But yeah, these are great questions. Yeah, they really are. Um, Mary has a great question. She would like you to explain that piece of equipment that's currently showing. Yeah, so this is um, a rosette, um, and 
it uh, basically, if you look on the bottom, you can kind of make out some metal bits and some black bits. And so there's a, a, a suite of sensors that's kind of strapped down here on the bottom. And it measures pretty much everything we want it to measure. So salinity, temperature, it measures depth, um, dissolved oxygen. It measures um, color dissolved organic matter, which we can use as a proxy for kind of land-based inputs to the coastal ocean. And so you basically lower this on a, on a wire. That wire is communicating with those sensors. And you get live profiles of those variables um, as you go down in the ocean. And then these gray cylinders are uh, Niskin or Nansen, or I'm never sure which, which one they are. But they're bottles that basically open from both ends. Um, by that wire, you send a signal when it's at a certain depth saying, I want to collect water here. It releases, there's a little magnetic switch that releases those caps and basically closes the bottle and you trap a, um, a parcel of water in that that would, um, you know, otherwise you couldn't get without contaminating. So you can sample throughout the water column as well. Um, so it's often called kind of a CTD rosette um, and, and it's pretty, pretty common. If you go on a research vessel, odds are they're going to have a, a, a rosette um, with a CTD system. And you're using that in your research? Yeah, exactly. So that's where we get a lot of the information about the salinity and how that changed. Um, we can see the vertical distribution of the, the phytoplankton biomass. That's also where we collected those samples that we showed, right, how those um, communities were changing. Those were at different depths um, for each of those months and stations. So you're just getting your your phytoplankton samples from the water that's collected by the Niskin bottles in that rosette. Exactly. Yep. Perfect. So you Perfect. Target some depth, then you bring it up, and then you run all your samples. Great. Ross has a question about the correlation. Is there a correlation between whales and phytoplankton when these algal blooms happen, or is this runoff from farming and factories? Between whales and phytoplankton, was that the? Question? Yeah, I'm guessing he's asking if you see a uh, higher incidences of whales during algal blooms, or so, if they're just a product of farming and factories. Right. So, um, I mean, whales are typically eating things a little bit bigger than the phytoplankton, so more in the kind of zooplankton um, area. But but we know that larger consumers can definitely. Um, target and feed kind of uh, selectively on areas where those zooplankton are aggregated. Um, in terms of kind of like the farm-based runoff um, or land-based runoff, uh, yeah, a lot, most of the nutrients that are coming from uh, through the Mississippi River are from not Louisiana. They're usually from you know up in the the kind of breadbasket of the U of the U.S. and are from you know a lot of that runoff of primarily nitrogen. Um, and and so certainly in kind of the flood uh, the flood project that that is ultimately kind of the origin of a lot of those nutrients for Hurricane Harvey um, there's also a lot of you know land based runoff that was coming into Galveston Bay and then out into the ocean um, if you recall if people recall during Hurricane Harvey there were some failures of some um, like uh, wastewater treatment systems and some industrial plants and so. There were actually a lot of um, different uh, sources of those nutrients that, that were getting pushed in through the, the Galveston Bay and out into the ocean. And, and ultimately, not just nutrients, which we think of as like good for phytoplankton, but also um, some pollutants, which may have had kind of a counteracting effect as well. Perfect. And then this is this is a great question too. Like they all have been, but this. This, I think, is going to tease your brain a little bit. So Sarah is asking if phytoplankton can change the path of a hurricane. Interesting. Well, I think phytoplankton are all powerful. Um, I don't know that. <laughs> uh, I don't know that they can quite do that. Um, but, but you know, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of like really interesting feedbacks between the ocean and the atmosphere. And certainly there are times when you have a really large algal bloom and that can actually, because of the amount of light they absorb, that can actually warm the surface of the water, you know? And so um, so whether that would influence a hurricane, I'm not sure, but, but 
um, you know, the first thing that you learn in kind of an oceanography class is that it's really hard to understand the ocean without understanding the atmosphere and vice versa. So um, yeah, I, very, very interesting question. I'll have to, yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that some more. Yeah, that that's a really cool, cool to think about that unicellular plants. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. <laughs> to have that kind of macroscopic scale effect. Yeah. Um, David, David, hey, we hunt. Um, glad to see you on. But he's got a great question too about whether there is a greater impact on plankton after a major event. Is it the mixing of the water or the influx of fresh water? Yeah, no, that's a great question too. And um, some of the work that, so we're, we're also working as part of a larger group of scientists who are trying to understand more, you know, kind of generalities of, of what the ecosystem impacts of, of these large storms are. And part of what, what it comes down to is, is, is it a, a fast and, you know, strong storm or is it a wet storm? And so certainly Hurricane Katrina, when Hurricane Katrina moved um, through the Gulf of Mexico, um, it's uh, the, the cyclonic um, movement of the storm actually induced upwelling, which is an oceanographic feature. And so that, they, they actually tied um, the effects on the phytoplankton where they saw kind of an increase in biomass. It's actually the influence, the influx of nutrients via upwelling. So this new nitrogen kind of coming into the system. Um, on the flip side, then there are other studies, including ours, that, that point to kind of this if the impact is via floodwaters, via fresh water kind of coming out, and that tends to lead to a slightly different set of outcomes. Um, it also depends on what the, what the environment is like before you sample or before the, um, the event comes through, which we often have a hard time having that data, right? Because we don't necessarily know when these storms are coming or can get out. Uh, and so uh, whether or not it's a really well mixed water column, then the hurricanes tend to have less of an impact um, because everything's already getting mixed up and it's a little bit less of a, of a disturbance on those um, organisms that are current that are already there. Perfect. Shannon has kind of a policy-based question um, and she is asking if your work has any implications for environmental regulations. Yeah, so um, it's pretty hard to talk about the Mississippi River without thinking about all of the nutrients that make their way into it. So I think definitely um, thing, being able to show how these flood events um, from the Mississippi River especially are having negative impacts on coastal waters, I think you know, adds to already a very rich set of, of evidence that um, you know, ultimately nutrients that are running off primarily agricultural lands into the Mississippi River um, are, are currently unregulated and that there is a, a real need for um, innovations in agriculture and in livestock, but also in, you know, trying to reduce those loads um, so that we can minimize those impacts in the estuaries. Um, you know, we already know that the oysters were really hard hit in 2019 and that uh, it's hard to get oysters, you know, last year and this year because of that. Um, we're also working with oyster biologists at LSU because we know that when the phytoplankton communities change, that what do oysters eat? Phytoplankton, right? There's this kind of intersection there as well. So, you know, if if we continue to kind of push these really nutrient-rich waters into the estuaries, it can have some really long-lasting and kind of um, additive or synergistic outcomes. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, Claire has a has a very timely question um, since we're coming up into that period of the calendar year. She's asking about how you might expect the changes in phytoplankton that you've seen to impact the extent and severity of the hypoxic episodes in the Gulf. Yeah. And so, you know, we didn't even really, and we did sample on GOMEX, some of the, the kind of classical dead zone area, and we did see a fair bit of, of hypoxia there. Um, you know, when we when we have high productivity in those warm summer months where that biomass sinks and, you know, gets degraded and, and all the ox oxygen gets used up, it, those are the conditions that are perfectly ripe for the um, for the uh, the hypoxic zone and the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. But I know that there has also been done, uh, 
uh, some really great work by Nancy Rabelais at Lumpon, right, has been done looking at kind of the, the flood versus drought years and how that correlates with, you know, worse or not as worse um, uh, dead zone kind of extents. And, and certainly those years where you have kind of large floods and large inputs of nutrients and, and biomass kind of after that can certainly lead to some of those um, kind of enhancing that dead zone and exacerbating that hypoxic issue. Um, oh, this is this kind of goes back to a previous question. How significant is the effect on carbon sequestration by the less efficient food pathway? Could more frequent or longer flooding events be kind of a feedback loop with climate change? Yeah, and that's exactly you know why we are interested in studying kind of those different pathways in those food webs. Um, the, the point that I made at the end was that it affects how much of that carbon or energy moves up to higher trophic levels. Um, so that's really important from kind of a food web perspective. But yeah, the other side of that coin is that if it's not moving into, you know, these larger copepods, for example, these zooplankton that produce these massive fecal pellets that sink really efficiently down to the, end, the, the bottom of the ocean, although not, you know, entirely. Um, and instead, right, they're getting munched on by these um, kind of sloppy eaters, these really small eaters that then are getting munched on by something else in the surface ocean, then that does, that creates a feedback loop where that carbon stays in the upper surface, upper mixed layer, the, the top part of the ocean, and basically can be remineralized, can be recycled, re-emitted um, back to the atmosphere via respiration. And so, um, you know, how much Grazing by that on that less efficient side results in you know this much carbon dioxide moving back to the atmosphere. I don't have a great number for that right now, but um, it's certainly an area that we're trying to better understand because it's it's pretty it's an understudied part of that kind of biological carbon pump when that pump gets kind of leaky back to the atmosphere. Yeah, that'd be great to figure out. Um, Mary has another question about um, nanoplastics, so she's asking. Have you ever thought of studying the impact of nanoplastics on phytoplankton? I, so yes, we had a, an RU student who worked in our lab two summers ago who came in and was like, I want to work on microplastics. And I'm like, how about the smaller stuff, which are those kind of nanoplastics that, you know, you still have to look at under a microscope. Um, we found insane quantities. Uh, we were looking in... Uh, our local watershed in Lafayette, um, the Vermilion River, kind of out into that Vermilion Bay system um, and some other kind of estuarine systems. And, and you definitely were seeing really high numbers. You know, the challenge, the thing that actually kept that student busy for the first half of her research project, were, you know, finding those methods to differentiate mi micro or nanoplastics from phytoplankton. And luckily, there are methods that are pretty straightforward. Um, and yeah, once you start looking, they are everywhere. Um, does a consumer differentiate between a, you know, a plastic particle or a diatom or, you know, a chlorophyte of a similar size? Um, probably not. And so there are there are most definitely some um, some kind of impacts on those consumers, uh, and there there could even be some impacts on the phytoplankton via, you know, some of the, the toxic effects of those plastic materials. Um, so it's not an area that we've done a lot of work in right now, but um, we've definitely dabbled in it. And it certainly is an issue that I think a lot of us are thinking about a lot of the time. We're going to take two more questions and then uh, we'll let you get back to your um, your social distancing and uh, <laughs> Isolation, but um, Bubba has a question about how what effects does the nutrient enrichment and phytoplankton blooms affect shrimp, oysters, and other small creatures in the Gulf food web? Sure. So um, it, it depends, right? So sometimes you have some nutrients that come in, and you have some phytoplankton that bloom, and everything is great, and those get gobbled up, and everyone's really happy. Um, other times, uh, and this is one of the effects that we've seen kind of every year now when the Mississippi River gets high and they open spillways to kind of relieve some of that pressure, and we see these toxic algal blooms in Lake Pontchartrain. Um, those toxic algal blooms or, or harmful algal blooms, right, we see them in 
coastal um, waters and you know fresh water as well. Um, those have different effects, and so those um, blooms are typically a toxic or have some other um, kind of negative impact. And and what that means is that they're typically not fed on as much by um, oysters or shrimp or small fish or you know some of those organisms that other things eat. And so um, ultimately, you know, an algal bloom can be something that really drives a lot of the productivity that we see in the ocean. Um, or it can be something that's really a negative event for um, for those organisms. And, and a lot of those cases, if, if you're trying to eat a toxic algal bloom as an oyster or as a, a shrimp, there can actually be some negative impacts on, on those organisms themselves, reduced growth rates, reduced reproductive rates. Um, those toxins can bioaccumulate, which means that then they continue to move up those food webs and ultimately it can become an issue for humans as well. Um, so you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. We we want, you know, healthy, productive coastal waters, but we also don't want um, so much stimulation of productivity that we, we get those toxic blooms that are really harmful. Good. Thank you for that. And then we're going to end this evening with a question from who I am assuming is one of your largest fans. Her name's Holly, age eight. <laughs> and she is wondering, what the hardest part of your job is oh well hi holly it's really nice it's, uh, <laughs> yes my goddaughter it's very very nice to connect remotely i miss everybody um uh the hardest part of my job is that there are so many questions <laughs> that are interesting and you know, and I have I have a great lab with like awesome students and and lab members, and you know we're like oh this would be fun. So that flood project was not planned, and we were all kind of maxed out. We're kind of like we probably shouldn't do this, but we're like well, let's do it. So I think the hardest part is just that um, you know there's there's so many questions um, and so little time. I guess is the 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 easiest way to say that. <laughs> All right, that ends this evening. Thank you, Beth, so much uh, for agreeing to present on our science talk series um, online for our audience. Again, just a reminder for those of you who are listening, we do have these talks weekly. Our next talk, of course, will be next Thursday at 7 Central. Um, and Next week's speaker will be Dr. Stephanie Archer, who's a LUMCOM faculty member, and she'll be talking all things sponges. <laughs> so we hope you can join us for that talk. Of course, you can get talk information, registration information, and a speaker lineup on our website at lumcon.edu forward slash science hyphen talks. And you can see what we have coming up. We have some great science. Another couple of reminders, you will get a confirmation email with the link to that web page if, um, if you can't remember just off the top of your head <laughs> the nonsense coming out of my mouth. But uh, you will also get a confirmation email with a certificate attached. So um, you can show everyone that you've been, been to one of our talks. And uh, for those of you who are attending for the first time, just a little announcement. If you attend 10 LumCon Science Talks, you will get a Pelican Challenge coin. So there is a little gift that goes into attending 10 of these lectures. They do not have to be uh, consecutive. Any 10 will get you a challenge coin. Again, on behalf of myself and the entire LumCon faculty, thank you for attending. Stay safe, stay healthy. And we're getting a lot of comments. Everybody's saying, great talk, great lecture. Oh, um, thank you so great much for having me. This was really fun. It was nice to have you. With that, we'll say goodnight. Bye. Bye. <laughs>